all sin at its root is unbelief. All sin at its root is unbelief. At the root of every sin that you and I commit, there is something about God and His Word that we are not really believing. Look at any sin in your life and you will find some type of unbelief behind it. If you sin by being overly controlling, uh, we're not really believing that God is in control. When we sin by uh, choosing the world and sin's pleasures before God, uh, we don't really believe that God's pleasures are greater than sin's pleasures. When we sin by stealing, uh, we don't really believe that what God has for us is enough. You see, if you look at any sin we commit, there is something behind that that we're not believing about God. And that's important to think about when I ask you this question. What freedoms do you think you'll lose by trusting in Christ? What freedoms do you think you lose by trusting further in Christ? What I can tell you for sure is whatever that freedom that comes to mind is, I promise you that it does not compare to the freedom that God has for you in Christ. That is a far greater freedom than any freedom you're holding on to in this world. You know, many people settle for a form of freedom that is not the real thing. Culture tells us that freedom is being our own Lord. But the Bible tells us true, real, and lasting freedom enters our lives when we turn to the Lord. Freedom comes through submission to the Lord. And it is only through this type of freedom that we can actually change. And that's the take-home message this morning. If you're taking notes, there's bulletins on your seats. I would strongly encourage you to take notes. I know when I preach, I seem to cover a lot of ground. So I think it helps if you take notes. But this is the take-home message this morning. Turning to the Lord frees us to truly change. Turning to the Lord frees us to truly change. You know, people search far and wide in this life for inspirations and motivations and techniques to change for the better. But that can only happen by turning to Christ. That's the only way you can experience real and lasting change. But when you do that, you can really be transformed for the better. These verses I'm about to read this morning are famous verses, but I hope we can look at them with fresh eyes. And so look at verses 16 through 18 with me. I'm going to read them for us as we get started. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So we're going to see three ways in this passage that turning to the Lord brings us into greater freedom in Christ, okay? And here's the first way. Turning to the Lord frees us from spiritual blindness. Turning to the Lord frees us from spiritual blindness. Before we turn to the Lord, we are blind. We are in spiritual ignorance. We cannot see reality as it is. But there is an amazing thing that happens when we turn to the Lord. Suddenly, we can see reality. Suddenly, we're not blind. Look at verse 16. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now this phrase, when one turns to the Lord, this is talking about one of those big Christianese words, repentance, okay? This is talking about repentance that leads to salvation. Now repentance in the Bible literally means to change one's mind. It means to stop thinking one way and totally start thinking a new way. It means to stop going one direction and suddenly start going another direction. The greatest picture of repentance, I believe, in the Bible is probably the prodigal son. The prodigal son went to his father 
and ask for the inheritance. Now, in that world, um, you didn't get the inheritance from your father until your father died. So the son was effectively saying, Father, I wish you were dead. (laughs) Not a very respectful thing. And he took the father's inheritance and he went to a far country and he squandered it in wild and reckless living. And suddenly the son was feeding on what the pigs eat and no one was helping him. And it says he came to his senses. He said, what am I doing? When I was with my father, I had everything I needed. And he literally changes his mind and he turns back home and he returns to the father. That is a picture of biblical repentance that leads to salvation. And that is what Paul is talking about when he says when one turns to the Lord. Now, when Paul says this, uh, he follows it by saying the veil is removed. What does that mean? The veil is removed. Well, the veil is what prevents a thing from being understood. The veil makes us blind. It's over our face so we can't see. It keeps us in the dark. It represents continuing in unbelief. That's why Jesus said, when the blind lead the blind, both fall into a pit, right? When the veil is over our eyes, we cannot see spiritual reality. And you know, some veils are thicker than other veils. Some hearts are harder than other hearts. You know who I think might have had the thickest veil? Paul. Paul had a thick veil. What was Paul's veil? What kept Paul from coming to Christ? Uh, you'll see on your bulletins, uh, Philippians 3, 4-7. through 7. But here's what it says. Uh, Paul is talking about the confidence he had in the flesh or the confidence he had in himself apart from Christ, okay? He said, If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He's saying, you think you have confidence in your good works? I have more of that. But I love what he says in verse 7. He says, whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. You know, when Christ showed up to Paul on the road to Damascus, uh, Paul realized he didn't have the one thing that mattered, Christ. And it begs the question for us, what keeps us from turning to Christ? What keeps us from turning to Christ? For the unbeliever, I'm saying, what keeps that person from turning to Christ for salvation? But I also mean for the believer. You know, John Calvin said, our hearts are an idol factory. The definition of an idol is simple. It's anything you put before God. Things can be good things, but when you put them before God, they become bad things. They become idols. And I just want to challenge you uh, to examine your hearts as I examine my heart with you about the things that keep us from becoming more like Christ, the things that stifle our sanctification, okay? There's five Ps here. What keeps us from turning to Christ? Position often keeps us from turning to Christ. By position, I mean your station in life. It could be the idea that turning more to Christ, uh, it either threatens the position you do have or it threatens the position you aspire to have. So position can keep us from turning to Christ. I would say possessions is another one. I'm talking about materialism. I'm talking about money and things or the desire for money and things. And we put these things uh, before God rather than using them in service to God. Uh, The greatest picture I can think of of someone who struggled with the idol of possessions was the rich young ruler. Remember, Jesus came to this young man and it says he went away sorrowful from Jesus for he had great possessions, right? Right? A third one is pleasure. Uh, Paul says in the last days, and we're living in the last days, so he's describing us. He says, some in the last days will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And so some of us hold on to the world's pleasures and sin's pleasures 
rather than letting go and turning to God for his pleasures. Now, I find that ironic because in Psalm 16, it says about God that in his right hand are pleasures forever. So the pleasures of God so infinitely surpass the pleasures that we grasp tightly to in this life. Nonetheless, those pleasures hold on to our hearts and stifle our growth. A fourth one would be power. By power, I mean a desire for control. Maybe the idea of letting Christ take the driver's seat of your life is just something you can't bear. Because if you're a follower of Christ, he's not going to follow your plan. You're going to follow his plan. You're going to have to give up control. Now, he has a better plan. But sometimes we're afraid to trust him. And so we hold on to our power, our fleeting power. And the fifth one would be pride. You know, pride really is at the root of all of this, isn't it? Paul had the most sinister form of pride, spiritual pride. You know, Paul said, as to righteousness under the law, he was blameless. You know, if anybody was going to earn their way to heaven, it was Paul. He kept every rule perfectly. But Paul would acknowledge that the danger of pride is everybody else can see it but you. Pride is a blinding sin. That's why we need people in our lives to tell us when we're becoming prideful. Now it may be one of these five. Uh, It may be something else. But I would ask you this. uh, Whether it's here at church or whether it's after service, I would challenge you to ask the Lord this morning, Lord, am I putting any of these idols before you? Am I putting any of these idols before you? Ask the Lord. Guess what? The good news is he already knows anyway. You don't have to hide from him. But you'll find grace and you'll find greater freedom in Christ as you become less spiritually blind. You know, when it comes to a person... uh, entering into Christ or coming to Christ, I've noticed that one of two things typically happens, okay? One of those things is a person no longer has any resources. This is the prodigal son, right? He went away with all these resources. He squandered all of them. And suddenly he looked up and he had nothing left. And he said, it would be better for me to be with my father. I'm going to go back home. So often we have to have no resources. It's actually a mercy of God that he takes our resources when we're not walking with him. Because as long as we have those things, some of us will never depend on him. So a person has to have no resources before they return to Christ. But there's a second way. The second way is a person can have resources, but they count their resources as nothing in the face of what Christ has to offer. This is the the parable of the pearl in the field. Remember Jesus told this parable about a man who found a pearl in a field and he went away and sold everything he had and came back to that field and bought that field just to have that little pearl? Uh, This is the picture of a person who looks at their life. They look at their accomplishments. They look at their wealth. They look at anything that this world counts dear and they say, this doesn't mean anything in comparison to Christ. But I want you to hear me on this. Whether you're the first person who hit rock bottom and turned to the Lord, or you're the second person who suddenly sees how meaningless all these things are in life apart from Christ, either way, we have to come to Christ with no resources. We have to come to Christ with no resources. The person who thinks they have greater resources than what Christ has to offer, will never turn to Christ. So we have to be able to look at our lives and say, anything I think I have cannot compare to Christ. But when you do that, you will enter into greater freedom. He will open your eyes to things. He will free you from spiritual blindness. Turning to the Lord frees us from spiritual blindness. The second one is this. Turning to the Lord frees us from spiritual bondage. Turning to the Lord frees us from spiritual bondage. Look at verse 17. This is a famous verse. It's an awesome verse. 
Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Freedom. I mean, what value do we hold up higher in our country than freedom? This is where real freedom is. Real freedom. Eternal freedom. Now, if the first point was talking about repentance, right? Changing our mind, thinking a different way. Uh, This second point is about another big Christian word, regeneration. Okay, regeneration is simply to be born again. That's what it means. Regeneration means to be born again. It means to have your heart affections changed. You know, before revival can happen outside of you, regeneration must happen in you. Before revival can happen in the corridor, regeneration has to happen inside of us, right? And there's an amazing thing that happens when we turn to the Lord. He goes into our heart. He performs spiritual heart surgery. He changes our affections. He changes our loves. I don't know that there's a greater miracle in this world than seeing a person who is going one way and loving the things of the world and God reaches in, regenerates the heart, and now they're going another way. Now they love new things. I mean, what greater miracle is there than that? And that is what happens when we become truly free. But it involves giving up a lot. In John chapter 3, there is a man named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. I always found that interesting. Why did Nicodemus come to Jesus by night? Well, I think it's because he had a lot of resources in this life. He had a pedigree, a prestige about him. Uh, It was said about Nicodemus in Israel that he was not just a teacher, he was the teacher. Okay, This man was highly respected, but he couldn't keep himself back from, from coming to see who Jesus was because he saw God in Jesus. He saw Jesus rightly. But Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, 3, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, he said, Jesus, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? You know what he's really asking here? Jesus, are you telling me that I need to start all the way over? Don't you know my education? Don't you know my position? Jesus says, yes, Nicodemus. You have to start all the way over. Now, the amazing thing about Nicodemus is by the end of the Gospel of John, Nicodemus is a follower of Christ. We see Nicodemus helping with the burial of Jesus. So it is a reminder to us whether you have no resources or great resources, Jesus can get a hold of your life. But Nicodemus did experience regeneration, but he had to start all the way over. Regeneration, it's almost like if there was a dead person on an operating table, spiritually, that person's heart has to be totally revived or else they're spiritually dead. And apart from Christ, we're like that dead person on an operating table. Our heart's not beating. And so when we come to Christ, God reaches in. He he makes our heart beat again, and we are regenerated, and we truly have life, and we truly have freedom. But if that's what happens when we come to Christ, the Bible also talks about remaining in Christ's freedom. Okay, as Christians, we are actually able to enslave ourselves to sin again. We are called to live into Christ's freedom. And so, uh, for those who are listening, who you've made that decision, you've turned to the Lord, I just want to give you three practical ways to continue living into that freedom, okay? How do we remain in Christ's freedom? Here's the first one. We obey what we already know. Sounds simple enough. Uh, This means you do the fundamentals, right? The the easy things, the simple things. As Tom says often, they're, they're easy to understand but not always easy to do. But we obey what we already know. And Paul said in Galatians 5.1, he said, For freedom Christ has set us free, 
Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. He's saying, don't go back and and dig up the old buried corpse and start living the way you used to be, right? Before you were buried with Christ and raised with Christ. Don't go back. Don't submit again to the old way of sin, the old life of sin. For freedom, Christ has set us free. You know, it says in Philippians 4, 9, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. You know, as Christians, sometimes we lack peace because we're not doing the fundamentals. Sometimes we lack peace because we're not obeying what we already know. Sometimes we want to know more, but we're not even obeying what we already know. And so the first step to remaining in Christ's freedom is obey what you already know. But that leads to an inevitable second point. We confess our sins. Because while we're going about the business of trying to obey, we all sin, right? We all get it wrong. And we have to be willing to admit when we're wrong. We have to be willing to confess our sins. You know, this was a big one for me uh, as I was growing up uh, into Christ and Um, I remember uh, growing up in a Christian school my whole life, I learned Christianese really well. Like I knew the right things to say, but I don't know as a young man that I really let anybody uh, inside spiritually. I don't know that I really let people look into my soul. I wasn't very good at Christian accountability. And something that changed for me in my 20s was I began to let other people hold me accountable. I was leading a a young adult small group in Michigan, and we made a commitment, uh, me and these guys, that we were going to hold each other accountable, that we were going to confess our sins when we got it wrong. And our main verse uh, was James 5.16, which says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Listen, forgiveness Eternal life, that comes through Christ. But he does bring healing through confession of sin. If you've ever been in a situation where you got something off your chest, you said, hey, I got this wrong, you always leave that conversation a little bit lighter. And some of you are carrying around a lot. And you need someone in your life you can talk to. And so God will bring healing through confession of sin. But here's the good news. Uh, First of all, God already knows you got that wrong anyway. So you can think you're hiding it from him, but he already knows. And the other good news is the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we bring our sin to God, guess what we get met with? Grace, not shame, grace, forgiveness. Sometimes the best way to stop a sin pattern from developing is confess it early and don't go down that path. This is why we do life groups at Prairie Bible Church because we know that beyond Sunday, we need other Christians in our lives. We weren't meant to do it alone, right? So how do we remain in Christ's freedom? We obey what we already know. We confess our sins. And here is a really important one. We study the truth. We study the truth. Write down John 17, 17. John 17, 17 Jesus' high priestly prayer, he said to the Father, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. So we turn to the word, right? We turn to the word to learn the truth and then we obey the truth. You'll see John 8 up there. This is Jesus speaking to the Jews who had believed in him. So Jesus is speaking to Christians here. And he says, if you abide in my word, abide means to remain or stay. If you stay in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Freedom. Freedom through the truth. Now, I will speak for myself on this. I have found, again, particularly as a young man, that the enemy would lie to me about this all the time. Often I wouldn't read my Bible because the enemy would say, why do you want more rules? Those are just going to hold you down. 
But that is so antithetical to what the gospel teaches us. What the gospel teaches us is that the word of God is not just a set of rules. The word of God has truth in it, and that truth leads to freedom. And so what we do is we go to the word of God where we learn the truth and we obey that and we experience greater and greater freedom. Empty religion says, this is more rules and less freedom. The gospel says, uh, this is more truth and greater freedom. Don't let the enemy deceive you about what the Bible is. Turning to the Lord frees us from spiritual blindness. Turning to the Lord frees us from spiritual bondage. And here's the last one. Turning to the Lord frees us for spiritual transformation. Notice how the first two were from, and this one is for, right? Turning to the Lord frees us into this. Look at verse 18. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So if the first point was about repentance, changing one's mind, returning to the Lord, and the second point was about regeneration, being born again, having our heart affections changed, uh, this third point is about another big Christian word, sanctification. Okay, sanctification. Sanctification is the lifelong process of becoming more like Christ. The lifelong process of becoming more like Christ. Notice how I stress lifelong process. I don't know anyone who has become completely like Jesus in this life. If you know anyone like that, please send me their contact information. I would love to talk to that person. We don't become completely like Jesus in this life. I don't care how well you do this. The best picture I have of sanctification is my family, we would go to Michigan over the summer. We would go to Lake Michigan, okay? And uh, you could stand on the beach and look out to this big body of water, Lake Michigan, Now, when I look out on that big body of water, I look as far as I can, uh, what I see is the horizon. Now, if someone said to me, go to the horizon, and I hopped in a boat and I rode out there, what would happen when I reached the horizon? Another horizon. And someone says, go to the next horizon, and I, I drive out there, and then what happens when I get there? Another horizon. Well, that's a lot like sanctification, isn't it? You know, if God showed me all the wickedness in my heart at once, it would probably kill me. So he graciously doesn't do that. Instead, he says, Billy, listen, I, have this, I see this thing in your life that it's a blind spot. You've got to work on this. And you go after that, right? You chase that horizon. And we have some control over how fast and how hard we go after that, right? We can get stuck. But in this life, When you go after that horizon, there's always a new one. There's always some way that God wants to make you more like Christ. And so sanctification is kind of like chasing horizons. And it begs the question, why do we do it? It's hard, right? It's hard to become like Christ. Well, we do it because we want communion with God. There was a time in my life where I wanted to be far from God. Today, I want to be as close to him as possible. The Bible says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We should be pursuing holiness because God said, be holy, for I am holy. And so we pursue sanctification. You know, I recently helped uh, with a funeral for someone's husband from our church, and doing a funeral is a good thing for a pastor because it reminds you that in all of this work we seek to do for Christ, in all of the becoming like Christ we do, um, basically that will end at some point. And so someday, this chasing horizons, uh, it will end. And Paul was torn about this. You know, when the Apostle Paul talks about this, He says, on one hand, I see how I need to become more like Christ. I see how more churches need to be planted. I see how the gospel needs to keep going. But on the other hand, I know it is better to be with Christ. 
On the other hand, I say, come back, Lord. And so we live in this tension, don't we? A healthy Christian lives in the tension of saying, I've got work to do, but I want the Lord to come back right now. It's okay to be torn about that. And it's okay to remember that someday Christ will return. And here's the good news. When he does return, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Praise God. That is glorification. That is when we receive the resurrection body, we see Christ, we are perfected. But our work here matters. And we need to chase that horizon as long as Christ gives us time and as we lean on Christ to do it. Turning to the Lord frees us to truly change. And turning to the Lord frees us from spiritual blindness, from spiritual bondage, and for spiritual transformation. As we get ready to close, you know, there is a passage that I just think sums up this whole conversation so well, and it's John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, uh, Jesus heals a man who was born blind. And so there's this man who was born blind, who had never seen, and suddenly uh, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are, are investigating the situation like detectives. You know, they're talking to his parents. They're saying, was he really born blind? Uh, they're, they're going to the man and asking him questions. And suddenly the man says in John 9, 25, seemingly exasperated, he says, one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Let me sum up the gospel for you in its simplest form. One thing I do know, I was blind and Jesus showed up and now I see. Listen, if you're getting peppered with spiritual questions that you don't know the answer to, eventually just say, listen, I don't know the answer to that. But one thing I do know is I was blind, now I see. Is there any greater miracle than that? Than the person who was heading one way had worldly affections, Uh, they were going after the pleasures of sin, and suddenly Christ shows up, changes this person's heart, and now they're going another way. The world can't argue with that type of testimony. That is the gospel. We were blind, but now we see. But there's another step to the gospel that Jesus references at the end of John 9. Band, you can come up. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him said to him, Are we blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt, but now that you say we see, your guilt remains. You know what Jesus is saying? Before you can see, you have to admit that you're blind. Before you can be healed, you have to admit that you can't heal yourself. Before you can be saved, you have to admit that you can't save yourself. That is the gospel. But the good news is, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And if you've never made that step, all you have to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. And the scales will drop from your eyes, and you will see reality for the first time. And for those of you here who have made that decision, ask the Lord, Lord, am I putting up any idols before you? Is there anything in my life that I'm putting between me and you? Prune me of that so I can become more like Christ. I'm going to be over in the prayer room if any of you needs prayer this morning. Let's stand and sing one last song together. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way and let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Now ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was given anew
My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom you faithful people he canceled my debt he called me his friend when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace so is over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your Savior displayed on a criminal's cross And darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in him That's when death was arrested and my life began Oh 